In recent years, we have expanded our resources to focus on equity and our partnership work is very important a part of this. We have put much attention and intention towards partnering with other national leaders such as Unidos US who support communities most affected by inequities, communities that do not have the same opportunities to be healthy where they live. That said, we are very excited to be co-hosting today's webinar with Unidos US, who is handling COVID response by supporting their affiliate network and their local communities. We will hear from them on how they support national and local programs and advocacy work, as well as we'll hear from one of their all-star affiliates, Esperanza Health Center, which is based in Chicago. I wanna start off by acknowledging that the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps Program is based at the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute and is a collaboration with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The program is the result of the contributions of many colleagues and partners in Wisconsin and across the country. So now I wanna introduce um, everyone to our great guests today. And I'll ask them to turn on their videos and I'll turn on my videos so everyone can see that we're, we're live real people working from home like many of our attendees probably. Um, and first of all, I just want to uh, say thank you to our guests, um, a really big thank you, not just uh, for your time today, but I want to express sincere gratitude for your energy, effort, and resilience exhibited in your work and that is exi exists in the communities that you serve. We are together persevering indeed through a dual crisis of a global pandemic, as well as conf confronting our reality of racism, violence, and social injustice in this country. While the latter has arrived at the forefront of national consciousness, I want to acknowledge the fact that racism and injustice is nothing new to communities of color in the US and that it's in fact really part of our history. That said, I believe that such a crucial part of navigating these dual crises is both awareness and action. So I'm grateful for both of you today, Rita and Carmen, for being here to share your stories, inclusive of successes and challenges. And I myself and, and the attendees may agree that we acknowledge that it takes immense energy and that there's a, an emotional toll in sharing the stories that include trauma and loss of life during these times. But I also know that there's immense, immense positivity in the stories that you're gonna share. So again, thank you for your energy, your openness and your positivity. That said, um, my name is Justin. I'm based at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps in Milwaukee. Um, and I have some great colleagues with me here today. Uh, Allie's gonna join us. Uh, Allie can say hi as well. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, so glad to share space with you this afternoon and look forward to fielding your questions that come in through the question and answer box. Thanks, Allie. And you'll see some of our other friends uh, named Raquel and James uh, in the chat link if you need help. Uh, and then again, most importantly, I want to introduce you to our guests. Uh, first, we're delighted to be joined today by uh, Rita Carrion, who is a Deputy Vice President of Health at Unidos US, uh, which is formerly known as National Council of La Raza. It's the largest national Latino civil rights and advocacy organization in the US. And in her current capacity, uh, Rita leads efforts to improve Latinos well-being and access to quality, equitable health care. Um, she works to address the social determinants of health and she helps cultivate leaders in health. Hi, Rita. Hi, Justin. Thanks for having us. It's of course, good to be thanks here. for being here. And also today we have uh, Carmen Vergara uh, of Esperanza Health Centers in Chicago. Carmen grew up in Chicago's little village neighborhood, famously known as the quote, Mexico of the Midwest. She's the daughter of diligent and hardworking parents who encouraged her to aim high. She earned a bachelor's degree in nursing and a master's in public health from the University of Illinois at Chicago. She's currently the Chief Operations Officer at Esperanza Health Centers, where she runs uh, four primary care clinics or federally qualified health centers, providing nationally recognized high quality care to over 30,000 patients a year, um, regardless of their income, insurance, or immigration status. So we're very excited to have you, Carmen. Welcome. Thank you, um, everyone. A uh, pleasure to be here, and thanks for the opportunity to be here with um, our fellow partners. Great, thank you both. And uh, I'll let everyone turn off their cameras so we can settle in and move into today's uh, webinar. Okay, so just a reminder here that I wanna share that there'll be an exciting opportunity to, to talk more with uh, Rita and Carmen after today's webinar in a discussion group to help deepen the learning. And most importantly, we wanna have conversations in this space to be face-to-face -face with the attendees as well, um, to bring your own stories and your own questions to the webinar participants. Um, so we're pleased to be able to offer these sessions in partnership with Healthy Places by Design. Uh, Joanne Lee will lead that, and uh, that'll be right after today's uh, webinar. There'll be more details in the chat near the end of the webinar. So let's get into some of our learning outcomes for today. Today, we're hoping to cover uh, kind of three buckets of things. We're going to describe health for Latino communities and the social determinants of health before and during the pandemic times. 
We're going to explore what Unidos US uh, is doing to respond and support Latino community during this pandemic, both at the national and local level. And we're going to identify and share how Esperanza Health Centers in Chicago are addressing COVID-19 response for Latinos. At this point in time, um, I'm going to get into some county health rankings roadmaps content. We all have a role to play in shaping our community's health. There are so many factors that influence how long we live and how well we live. Think of all the things that affect our health. Sure, we could all eat better, move more, and make sure we get our annual checkups. But there's more to it than that. The quality of our homes, the safety of our neighborhoods, and our chance at a good education all influence health in the short and long term. But how can we understand how all these things fit together? Meet the County Health Rankings Model. The model illustrates a broad vision for health. The model shows us that policies and programs play an important role in influencing the health factors that, in turn, shape a community's health outcomes. That means not just how long we live, but also how well we live. Health is complex. The County Health Rankings Model helps us see all the factors that impact health and understand where we can take action so everyone thrives. Visit countyhealthrankings.org to get started. Great, so I think that video kind of help, helps capture um, the, the mission and purpose of County Health Rankings. And the last note about um, saying that uh, working to make sure everyone thrives, we're really talking about equity and specifically uh, health equity. So health equity is a notion that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be health healthy. And that's very uh, important to the content of today's webinar. Um, in order to do this, we must remove obstacles to health such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness. And we must create access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments, and quality health care for everyone. So I quickly want to share um, the video walkthrough county health rankings model and many of our guests are very familiar with the model I know. Um, but we have a new feature on our website where there's an interactive model uh, where you can kind of click through each of the health factor areas and highlight certain areas in which you can look more deeply at the measures. Uh, and that helps us to best understand and look at um, how policies and programs do affect health factors, specifically in different uh, social and economic factors we'll discuss today, and that could lead to health outcomes in communities. So I want to touch on a very important feature um, of our data from the model. And the model helps us to understand um, what these measures look like in each community in the country. We provide snapshots uh, or county level data for nearly every county in the country. An important new feature is the disaggregated data measures we provide. And what they entail is they're easily accessible measures. Um, they're underlined in blue or hyperlinked. And you can click on them and see uh, data broken down by race and ethnicity. For many measures, we have uh, this available for American Indian and Alaska Native, Asian, Black, Hispanic, and white populations. And now it's now available for over 20 measures uh, in almost all of the county snapshots. And you can um, dig a little deeper by looking at both the ranked and unranked measures to see those. There's an example here of uh, premature death. I also want to share a few ways you can um, use your snapshot to see a specific few of these measures. So here are 10 measures that um, kind of rise to the top that you could look at. And an example here of, I've highlighted is children in poverty because we really think of it as kind of a um, barometer for social and economic conditions in communities. Uh, and here in the screenshot, you can see that um, the children in poverty rate, which is um, the percentage of those under the age of 18 living in poverty is 27% in this community. But when you break that down by race and ethnicity, uh, Latinos are living at 33 percent in poverty, Blacks in 45 percent, uh, as compared to their counterparts at 9 percent. Another important feature of the snapshots is to highlight that there's um, a potential to translate them into Spanish. And you can click on a, a button at the top that says Espanol, and you can see all the data and the measures in Spanish as well. So next I want to touch on really connecting um, health and equity uh, in the times of pandemic. And um, the backbone for this uh, timeline here is leaning on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's uh, report they just put out in July. Uh, it's a spotlight on their COVID-19 uh, work in Sentinel communities. And these are communities that are really doing some excellent work during the pandemic period. And in this uh, report, they help characterize the conditions for equity 
before, during, and after the pandemic. So I think it's helpful to look through this timeline and think about and ask these questions perhaps in your own community. What was the level of community interest and investment in, in health and well-being before the pandemic? Was there a focus indeed on promoting health equity and focusing on health equity? And as we see it now currently during the pandemic, do community efforts include coordinated response and cross-sector collaboration? And do response efforts include real-time actions to address health equity? And perhaps when we get into a phase um, when we are past the pandemic and we're thinking carefully about recovery, we could ask the questions that do recovery strategies include comprehensive monitoring and tracking with focus on most vulnerable populations? And do they include a focus on social and economic conditions and the differential burden placed on communities of color because of the effects of the pandemic? So I wanted to take the same timeline and these same um, breakdowns and kind of think specifically of how there might be different conditions that affect Latinos around the country. So if we think about pre-pandemic, there's a history of systemic inequality for Latinos in the areas of employment, housing, education, healthcare, and social services, right? There's been discriminatory policies and practices towards immigrants and their families. So that might translate to currently during the pandemic that there's disproportionately affected uh, groups of people such as Latinos that are experiencing these effects. There are higher rates of confirmed cases in Latinos and Latino youth that we're seeing. Latinos are facing challenges in seeking testing due to lack of access to healthcare and fear in the current immigration landscape. And there's potentially a higher exposure risk due to the employment of most Latinos uh, working in the essential services sector. And if we think about this post-pandemic period, we can ask the questions, will recovery strategies include the same access to social safety net and economic recovery for Latinos, uh, eliminate, eliminating barriers to coverage for the uninsured, and working to remove el eligibility restrictions that prevent mixed status families from accessing resources. Uh, a lot of this content was drawn from um, Unidos' uh, white paper on the pandemic issue, and I think it's a really great quote. I just wanted to read from it that captures this idea as well. And that says, the pandemic has exposed in a myriad of ways the unequal social and economic foundations on which Black and Latino families must build their lives compared to their white counterparts. This is not a matter of happens happenstance, but an underlying premise to the systems, institutions, and practices that undergrid the public policy response to the worst public health and economic crisis in the United States in 100 years. One other layer I want to put in this pre-pandemic uh, kind of analysis, if you will, is to share uh, this um, diagram from a report that Unidos had worked on uh, with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, where they did a full assessment of their um, affiliate network that works in the health space. And through this assessment, um, one of the main learnings was um, seeing that all these social determinants of health issue areas really do intersect and that they center around immigration policy and kind of this climate of fear, uh, which you'll see at the middle of the diagram. So if we think about the intersection between these various issue areas, uh, and we can look carefully at these connection points, and we will be sharing these slides after the fact, so you could dive in deeper. Um, we can think that uh, perhaps during the pandemic and afterwards, we're gonna see uh, these conditions and these issues further exacerbated and worsened. A few more uh, pre-pandemic social and economic conditions I wanted to touch on, and this is from County Health Rankings and Roadmaps here, is we really looked at uh, children in poverty. And again, this is data pre-2020, uh, so this is at the end of 2018. And looking at a national level, just what children in poverty looked like uh, comparing across groups. And we can see from the um, graphic on the right that uh, the white, I'm sorry, the orange and blue uh, dot, which represents um, white and Asian populations, um, was at roughly about 12%, 11% children in poverty. But if we look at uh, the yellow dot, Hispanic, and also further along for Black and American Indian and Alaskan Natives, we're looking at 25 to over 30% rates of children in poverty. Another way to look at these conditions too is to break them down by a few other measures we have in our snapshots. And here you can see uh, specifically across uh, the areas of unemployment, household income, and children in poverty. Uh, that there are definitely not parity between um, Latinos and whites in this country. What's important to think about is that from the Great Recession on up to 2018, which is when the data here ends, right, and this is pre-pandemic, we can see that some of these conditions were improving. Uh, unemployment was going down, household income was going up, children in poverty was declining. Again, the gaps were significant, but perhaps in these current times, we are not going to see the same trend uh, occurring. Lastly, I want to acknowledge that, um, and somewhat ironically, after talking about data a bit, that uh, it doesn't tell the whole story, and definitely not the whole story about disparities. Furthermore, according, um, we can see that the CDC uh, began releasing racial and economic, I'm sorry, racial and ethnic 
COVID-19 data back in April. And the data shows alarming disparities for people of color that are consistent with what we know um, in the disparities in social economic um, inequalities. But data never really speak for themselves, right? So there's context comparisons and caveats that are needed when we're looking at the quantitative data. And disaggregated data uh, should include um, population adjustments, uh, acknowledgement of social and economic conditions that drive inequities, and transparency about limitations in, in the own data and analysis. And uh, this kind of theme of uh, data not telling all about disparities, I just want to um, lift up some work from some of our University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute colleagues that worked on this, um, both Hillary Joyner and Olivia Little, and recognizing that there's more context that we need uh, during this pandemic time. So lastly, uh, I wanted to uh, convey some issues as to why data may not tell the whole story specifically for Latinos. And for this, we can think that race and ethnicity information is only available right now for roughly half of reported cases we're seeing across the country. And that the fear related to immigration status and lack of access to healthcare services may result in lower rates of testing and treatment for Latinos in their communities. And Carmen will share about this in a bit. And that furthermore, Latinos really make up a large share of the nation's youth. They live in larger family units at home and they disproportionately make up larger percentages of positive cases that we're seeing. To get deeper into these issues, specifically in Latino communities, I'm now gonna shift uh, and invite back um, Rita to talk. So, hey Rita. Hi Justin. So hey, welcome on back. <laughs> please, tell, please tell us about Unidos US uh, and your affiliate network a little more. Thank you. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here with you and sharing the space with all the county health rankings and Roma colleagues, as well as you know one of our um, ultimate stars uh, affiliates in Chicago, um, which are there are many in Chicago as well. But as Benanza Health Center, uh, would it be more perfect to to uh, to celebrate this week, uh, given that it's Health Center Week? Uh, so, you know, I think most of us probably know Unidos US is formerly the National Council of La Raza or N. CLR. So for those of you who are old timeies like myself, you know, that's how most people kind of relate to us. And so as Justin mentioned, we are the largest Latino national Latino civil rights and advocacy organization. We really are, um, you know, our breath and heart really lands on kind of the, the the mission that we want to improve opportunities for all Latinos. And um, the heart of that is our affiliate community-based organizations uh, and the innovative programs that we provide, the campaigns that we push out, uh, as well as you know, the advocacy and policy and advocacy and even the research you know, solutions that we push out. And so some of the white papers that you mentioned is some of our colleagues from um, uh, in our policy shop have put together for us amazing work, as well as um, you know, even the the policy priorities that we pushed out. So I do want to talk to you a little bit about our affiliate network. Um, the next map shows a little bit of where we are, kind of where we, we sit. They're community-based organizations. They run from community health centers to charter schools to community development organizations. Uh, and among them, you know, I think we, we do have nearly 2,000 FQHCs or federally qualified health centers that are critical safety net providers in the medically underserved areas. So uh, um, we're really excited to, to, to be in the space with our partners um, within our affiliate network. Uh, but I think one of the things for us in health is not only do we work on health, and most of us know this for our immigration work, we work on health, uh, housing, education, economic empowerment, uh, workforce development, and, and civic engagement, and to name a few, right? Uh, but in our health world, we really, our overarching framework really stems around kind of looking at the health equity lens and really improving not only uh, better access to care for communities, um, you know, of color, but really trying to build off of, you know, having much more healthier, equitable, resilient communities, addressing these social determinants of health is some of the work that we did with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation as a, as a major partner of ours, really cultivating our leaders who have been really in the forefront of a number of different things and, um, and shaping really a positive narrative about our community. You know, there's a lot of assets that we bring as a community. So I think the important thing here to note is that, um, you know, we, let, we want to make sure that Latinos have the building blocks to good health, you know, such as affordable quality health care, good nutrition, and positive social and emotional support. Um, and never more now than ever has this been important to better position our community, our country to be healthy and, and reach its fullest potential. 
Thanks, Rita. And I think just one key component of what you said about the affiliate network I wanted to lift up is that um, they're not obviously branded as Unidos US affiliates all the time. We may see them as local uh, Centro Hispanos or um, the FQHC uh, clinic in the Latino community. And knowing that this is part of a larger network that exists and that they function as different um, community-based organizations, of course. Um, so speaking of this kind of local approach, what, what have you heard about from local communities um, since the outbreak started and through the pandemic period? So as you've highlighted in, in earlier slides and the support of our organizations is really, you know, they've been at the front lines of helping the Latino community cope with the COVID crisis. And oftentimes, a lot of this has been with not enough adequate funding and resources, especially given the need and the demand. Um, and much, much of our work that we did and in, in, in not only working with our affiliates, but also supporting um, their collective efforts is that we had um, the importance of really start to create this Esperanza Hope Fund. It's not to be confused as the Esperanza Health Center, but it was this fund to really think about three different areas to really try to strengthen, you know, not only the response and recovery, but the resiliency within our communities to help navigate um, through this COVID pandemic. And so we're focused on three pillars. The first one is to lead a public health response by looking and being the go-to source for information, um, the importance of data collection, having access to that data. Uh, the second is really strengthening the affiliates and, and their resiliency to be able to um, provide emergency assistance to families, you know, the World turned upside down immediately from one week to the next, right? Um, and then providing, try, you know, really technical assistance to our network, you know, in, in different doses and, and be able to, to continue to keep their doors open. And then lastly, really leading an advocacy, a national advocacy response in Latino communities and mobilizing, mobilizing our communities in a number of different ways. I think a strong part of that mobilization is, you know, we're talking about this strong connection, obviously, between the economic conditions and downturn and and health and the Unidos affiliates, a lot of them as organizations are perfectly equipped and situated in that they work in a lot of these intersecting social determinants of health spaces already, right? They could be clinics that Absolutely. provide also housing and financial resources. So um, you're in that space and ready to do the work, which is fantastic. Um, so just please tell me a little bit more about what some of the local affiliates have been doing. So a lot of the, you know, there's really a lot of great stories. I would love to, to spend hours with you today and, and talk about every single one of our affiliates, but really, you know, a lot of the things that our uh, communities and our affiliate organizations or community-based organizations have assisted um, community members in an array of different things, not only our health affiliates in terms of COVID testing and providing information, uh, preventive information, but also food delivery and food distribution to address food insecurity, um, you know, really thinking differently about how to provide nutrition education into the communities, you know, through Zoom or Facebook Live, um, enrolling, helping, you know, uh, many individuals enroll into SNAP or the food, uh, the uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, but also, you know, really, you know, aiding and completing the rental assistance and unemployment forms. We had, you know, one of our affiliates, you know, even in Chicago, Mujeres Latinas in Acción, you know, was supporting extended hotel stays for victims of domestic violence when shelters were at a really limited capacity. We had a, a, a migrant health migrant center um, in uh, Florida, RCMA, who adjusted their services to deliver meal programs to students and their families, you know, provide food, you know, books and transportation and information um, to make sure that, you know, kids who, who were no longer learning at home um, still had a meal, um, uh, no longer learning at, in the classroom, but still had a meal at home. That's great. So I, like I mentioned earlier, there's so many positive stories, but obviously there's uh, immense challenges that have been occurring too. So could you maybe just uh, talk to those a bit? Yeah, so one of the things that we did at the beginning of, of, every, of when, you know, this pandemic started was re we conducted a series of listening sessions and, and surveys with our affiliates to assess kind of really the immediate needs, the challenges that, um, that they were starting to see um, from one day to the next, but even, you know, on the, on the mid to long term basis, you know, there was a lot of challenges in making sure that they were still able to deliver services while keeping their employees safe. Um, 
um, you know, having the adequate infrastructure to work remotely. Many of them did not have laptops or um, the capability to, to have some of their, you know, essential and non-essential uh, workers be able to work from home, um, including the promotoras de salud. Uh, and then the other thing is also just, you know, the lack of information. Early on, we weren't getting a lot of information in Spanish um, or to specific, you know, individuals. Uh, or when we started getting that information, a lot of it was very confusing. And, and um, one of the things that we wanted to do is really to address how can we help, you know, clear the, clear the way and, and, and provide clear and accurate information. Um, the other thing I think was super important as we started to see a number of relief packages or stimulus packages that were moving along up on the Hill or in Congress was to ensure that, you know, our community-based organizations were not left in the dark, that the most vulnerable in communities were also being served, you know, such as our DACA recipients, you know, legal immigrants that are entering the past five years or mixed status families or low wage workers, you know, that many of our, you know, uh, Latinos really represent in the hospitality and entertainment and healthcare um, work are be were being excluded and required special support to navigate this new reality. So for us, it was very important for us to make sure that we had a voice um, and uh, communicated with our legislators about this. And then I think the big thing, you know, that I don't want to leave out, and I think it's something that we struggle every day, um, is the accuracy of the data. Um, we weren't seeing early on any information on data around uh, race and ethnicity. It wasn't until in April that we started seeing the impact. And even now, we know that it's much, probably much worse than what we could imagine um, because we don't have all the information. You know, because you could imagine that, you know, when an individual gets sick um, or is sent to the hospital, they're sent by themselves. They're they're not able to talk. They're not able to, to be able to, you know, provide, you know, the most accurate information of how they self-identify. Um, and there, that's, in alone, is, is really problematic um, it, it, in a lot of different ways, you know, not only traumatic for the family not to be there, but also being able to accurately be able to support, um, you know, the community and, and that individual. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Rita. I think that uh, you're speaking again to the importance of the context with the data, right, and understanding that. And I just wanted to go back and translate. I know you said promotores de salud and, and that yes. is community, community health workers, um, since uh, I know not everyone's uh, bilingual on the webinar, and uh, thinking about them having to work remotely, right, and the work that they do right. since our, our audience very much knows the work of community health workers. Um, Great. So, I, you know, we've talked about a lot of social and economic issues so far, but um, how are you seeing these really intersect? I, I, I think this slide's really helpful to talk through that. Yeah, and I think our white paper talks a lot about this too. Um, and you know, talking about re you know working remotely, we we found out through actually not only just the white paper, but our relationship with Latino Decisions and Somos to do some polling uh, and finding out information. And we found out that Latinos have the lowest ability to work from home. Only about sixteen point two percent, about half of the percentage of them for whites, which are about thirty percent, are able to work from home. Uh, and you know, for for us, we know that Latino workers, you know, are over, you know, as I mentioned, are overrepresented in industry vulnerable to, you know, the su sudden economic shocks, including seasonal work, um, you know, are not, uh, you know, are in communities where um, they, they're, we're seeing the skyrocket. We actually have a series of, of uh, monthly uh, job reports that we can provide you um, information. I don't think I, I have a link, but I can find that for you. And even in that, you know, our, our May report of a Latino jobs report reveal that in April, Latinos unemployment rate grew 6% to 18.9% compared to the national rate of 14.7% over a short period of three months um, as a result of COVID. And even in July, while we made some, you know, decrease in unemployment, it still remains really high. You know, about 13% um, of those are impacted by um, unemployment. And Latinas, what we're seeing is also bearing the economic brunt of COVID. You know, overwhelmingly, we're seeing that, um, you know, women in general, you know, nearly make up two thirds of all frontline workers. So there's a lot of intersections here that, that I cannot necessarily do it justice in this, uh, you know, nine boxes of, of having the food insecurity, the essential jobs, you know, food insecurity for us has been a, a major issue. We've been working on it for a number of years, especially with our kids who were, you know, are in, in households that the rate was nearly 17% in 2018, and today it's nearly 37%. 
Uh, these are things that are happening in our world um, today. You know, the mental health and the, and the trauma, as you mentioned, um, you know, that was another area that we really needed to focus to have conversations with not only our community health workers about how do you navigate and how do you lead in crisis, but how do you support a community when you yourself are going through this. Um, so we know that you're even even currently now in the summer, as we start thinking about um, going back to work and how does this impact you know, our, our kids' learning, our social and emotional learning, um, we, we had a Spanish language webinar, um, you know, specifically focused on youth and mental health for our parents. Um, and we had that earlier this week. We've had over 3,000 people view it. Um, it's available on Facebook Live. It's also available on YouTube and our webpage. And so, you know, one of the things is that it's just, uh, you know, when we think about the social determinants of health, it's not just you know um, your health, your physical health, but it's everything around you and how that it, that is um, really impacting the way you're showing up um, every day. Yeah, thanks, Rita. And I think you know just touching on a few things. I think like unemployment, like you brought up, and thinking about the data there and and how we again need that context of right. That's probably data that's captured on more formalized employment, but how much right. work is done in more informal sectors uh, by Latinos around the country, right? So right. again, lending that context to this. So you've given us um, a lot to think about here, right? With like all these negative impacts, but let's let's come back to a little. Um, hope again or Esperanza here and if you could share more about the yeah no thank you yes yeah, so, you know I think we have to have this hope right or Esperanza fun and that's probably one of the reasons why we called it that is that we can we're a very resilient community and you know well, there's a lot of assets that we bring you know in, in cariño and corazón right um, so we've been able to in just a short month three months that you know when we were right and we also went remote right so like many of you and um, you know we were able to educate over eight thousand people you know through our social channel channels um, we partnered with many, many influential leaders like dr. Besser for the president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation you know legislators like like Ayana Presley, um, Raul Ruiz, a number of different people, right? Um, and being able to have a voice out there to show and uh, shape the public narrative of what we are seeing, I think is important. Um, and at the same breath, we also coordinated emergency loans and lines of credit through our Raza Development Fund, um, you know, organization that we work very we're very closely for struggling organizations to make payroll, pay rent, and while they're also navigating the, the, um, the crisis, uh, being able to provide, you know, at, at this point, we, we had 30 affiliates that we worked in, in providing immediate direct relief in, for them to be able to have just cash assistance to provide to their communities. We're going to be looking at another round of our affiliates, you know, for our Comprando Rico y Sano, we had actually provided them with um, a small stipend of um, within 25 organizations to help them, you know, stand up, um, work around food insecurity. So a lot of our results has been not only on the local level to support that, but also on the national level with our web pages, our resources, both in English and Spanish, these town halls, um, advocating for precise, accurate, and transparent data. I think that's a super important that we continue to do every single day. Um, we've written letters um, to, to critical states like Arizona and Florida about the importance of actually providing that information. And then on the national advocacy side, it's really, you know, a lending equity in this breath, right? Uh, making sure that we're reimagining and, and making, uh, you know, ensuring that um, any policy response includes that equity lens, um, that our communities are not being left behind. That's, that's great. Just a wealth of, of positive work going on. Thanks so much for sharing. And I know you wanted to touch on just kind of some of the advocacy component of, of the work you do at Unidos too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in everything that we do um, as a civil rights and advocacy organization, you know, I think at Unidos, we want to stress that everyone's voice matters. It's part of, you know, finding solutions to reimagine a new environment or a new community or a new America, right? And not every community has been in this together. You know, we've been all in different you know, ships and boats and, and lanchas, right? Uh, so I think the biggest thing is that we ask at Unidos is really register to vote or help someone do it. Register to vote by mail if your state has an option. And if you go to our website, you can find out all of the different states that have different deadlines. Um, and then 
just as importantly, respond to the census. I think that's super important, the 2020census.gov, uh, making sure that you know, you're know you putting in your information online or by phone or by mail. Those are the resources that are being placed into ensuring that you know we're leveraging support for communities, programs, and issues. I, I know I don't need to tell many of you today, but I think it's super important. I know for me, I just did it, you know, you know, two weeks ago, um, because of everything that that is handed out to us in our lives, right? It's super important to do the census. And then at the end of the day, you know, just to continue to stay healthy um, by following the public health guidelines and guidelines and um, ensuring that you, you know, show up with compassion and care and kindness and, and um, you know, recognize that, you know, where you sit at, at, at today, you know, maybe different of how you're showing up tomorrow, you know, so, so make time for, for, for rest and relaxation or, or just a time to breathe and meditate, right? Um, so what I do want is to, you know, we do have information on social media if you want to learn more and continue to find ways to activate your communities. Um, you know, you can follow us on at We Are Unidos US or go to our website. Um, but I think, you know, we also have a blog that showcases a number of different affiliates but what I'm really most excited today is is you know lending my time in the next you know to take a deeper look at how one health center has responded and caring for its community in the south side of, of Chicago and so I'm super honored um, to have you know join us is is an amazing Latina leader from her own community who is now leading you know one of our Chicago affiliates Esperanza Health Center is Carmen Vergara um, and so Carmen I love for you to just take the floor and and, and um, you know, highlight some of the work that you all been doing. Thank you so much, Amrita. Thank you for your partnership. Um, it's great to be here today. Yeah. Great, thank you, Rita, and thanks for, for closing out so many um, good last thoughts about Unidos and bringing back to mind the importance of um, some wellness and personal um, care during these times as well, uh, and the importance of civic engagement, obviously, too, of course. So thanks for queuing up uh, Carmen here, and we'll kind of move into what she can share with us about um, the work she's um, doing in Chicago. So just, Carmen, if you can, just tell us a little bit more about Esperanza Health Center. Sure. Um, good afternoon once again, everyone. Um, again, thank you for having me to here to share Esperanza's story, and thank you to County Health Ranking and Mapping, and of course to Unidos US um, for their invit invitation to participate in today's session. Uh, you know, so much that Justin and Rita um, have discussed so far in a big picture way and through data really resonates with what our patients and families have experienced over the past six months. Um, who we are um, uh, is uh, we are a, um, a health center on the southwest side of Chicago when our mission is to deliver health and hope for Chicago's underserved communities. And we make decisions based on our three core values of caring, quality, and family. Um, we are a federally qualified health center and we serve primarily low-income popula uh, Latino population. We um, have four locations and we serve about 35,000 patients a year across about 120,000 encounters. We provide care to adults, to pediatric patients. We provide specialty women's health services in addition to behavioral health and psychiatry. We have about 200 full-time employees. Um, we find it super important to make sure that all of our clinical staff are bilingual. Um, many, if not most, are also bicultural. Um, our um, hourly and front um, line staff are also from the areas that we serve. We find this to be super important to make sure that we're delivering culturally appropriate care. In terms of our size, we have about a $20 million annual budget. And we are very proud to say that our clinical care has received numerous recognitions as a national quality leader by our main regulator, the Health Resources and Service Administration. And of course, we are also a very proud affiliate of Unidos US. Thanks, Carmen. So there's, yeah, just a large scale of excellent, excellent work you're doing on the south side of Chicago there. So um, let's, let's get to the pandemic period here. And if, if you could just kind of walk us through the story and, and your timeline a bit of what you saw um, in Chicago's Latino community. Sure. Um, so, you know, our COVID story really begins on the 6th of March. Um, this is really when we began to mobilize and created our COVID-19 task force. Uh, this included myself, our chief medical officer, our director of quality, and our external affairs team. Uh, that core group quickly expanded to include our HR department, our chief financial officer, and our data team. 
as, as you know, the dire news began to circulate about COVID-19, we quickly um, decided to send home any um, non-essential clinical staff. And this was really to reduce um, any unnecessary risk to our staff um, and to begin preserving PPE, which at that time was basically considered gold because it was in such short supply. Um, really after sending about 50% of our staff to safely work from home, um, we tested our first patient the very next day on the 14th of March. Right around that time, um, yeah, Illinois gave the green light to start providing care via telehealth. And this was really a game changer for us because now we had the ability to continue providing care to our vulnerable populations in the safest way possible and really from the comfort of their own home. So within about three days, our team began to provide care using this new method um, that was really new to all of us. And from that point forward, at least 75% of our staff, um, both clinical staff and frontline staff, were safely working from home and we were simultaneously preserving PPE for um, specifically for our COVID testing. Telehealth was also um, something that saved um, our, any revenue loss that we might have had from service interruption, which would have been pretty devastating to us, but on some. So due to a large influx of phone calls that we started to get from patients who were starting to get sick, um, we launched a nurse triage line on the 18th of March. Um, our incredibly um, just resilient um, nurses took hundreds of calls a day and gave direct COVID care over the phone. You know, at times they were recommending and patients come in for testing, you know, other times they were recommending reposo at home, um, which means, you know, recovery and, and rest. And then other times they sent patients immediately to the hospital because they were really sick. So this triage system really kept patients from having to go to the hospital unnecessarily because at the time, one of the biggest worries were that the hospitals would be so overwhelmed. And so this triage system made sure that those who could recover at home were recovering at home while ensuring that those who really needed hospital level of care um, were receiving it. So, you know, we, we, we spent um, the last uh, two weeks of March piloting different ways to test, to test patients for COVID. We had decided pretty early on that given our core value of caring and family, that we were going to do our part in making sure that um, communities had access to COVID testing and we definitely weren't going to let any inequities um, happen on our watch. And so by April 1st, um, we had erected um, a tent at each of our two largest locations and we began to test patients and we were testing about 50 patients a day or so. And our data team right around that time also built and launched um, our data dashboard um, that ended up functioning as a core member of our task force team um, because this data dashboard was key to helping drive our decision-making process. About a week later, we had tested about enough patients, close to 300, to begin to see a pretty, a pretty grim picture of what was happening in the Latino community. Um, our positivity rate was 32%. And um, when our providers were calling patients to notify them that they were positive, you know, our patients were picking up the phone at work. And so this, you know, was a moment of pause for us because that's when we realized that, you know, if folks were still working while testing positive, then they were then exposing their peers. And we started to see a cycle of exposure begin at that time. You know, patients, you know, and as we started to dig in a little bit deeper, the patients began to report that they were, you know, considered essential workers and that they really couldn't work from home. And they were even afraid to tell their employers that they were positive for fear of any type of retaliation and possibly losing employment. And so um, soon after, we began to see a secondary exposure where these essential workers were bringing, you know, the virus, you know, home into their multi-generational households. So this really um, was, was problematic and we began to contact our local health department to share what we were seeing, to share our positivity data um, so that they would be aware of what was happening. You know, within you know, the next 10 days or so, as we continued to test patients, um, I you know, personally went to bed with a knot in my stomach because we had a positivity um, one day high of 67%. Um, it's just, you know, completely beyond what we were expecting to see. And also by then we had tested over eight, over 800 patients of our Latino patients and the cumulative positivity rate was 48%. 
And so we really, you know, once again, reached out to our local health department and their leadership team and, stand, and started to sound the alarm much more forcefully um, because of what we were seeing. You know, fortunately, um, we do have a very strong relationship with our local health department and they were um, pretty swift to take action about three days later um, on the 20th of April, um, Esperanza was um, on the city of Chicago's uh, racial equity rapid response team. I also, I also think that another reason why they acted so fast was because throughout March and April, um, Esperanza was really the only testing site doing this volume of testing. So our numbers um, really were a proxy for what was happening in the Latino community. Um, the racial equity rapid response team um, uh, through the, the city of Chicago advocated for more testing. And a few weeks later, um, the city launched testing sites in primarily Latino neighborhoods and testing became much more widely um, available at that time. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, I think it's such an important uh, story to see, you know, how you did such good work by contextualizing all the data with your own testing at the local level to be able to really draw more attention from city resources to help broaden testing across the Latino community overall. Um, and those are alarming, alarming rates uh, at a daily basis. So Absolutely. Um, let, tell me a little more just about the strength of how you were kind of capturing your own data. Sure. So, um, you know, this is the, the data dashboard that I referenced um, a bit earlier, and this is what we were using to help drive our decision making process. Um, it's gone through a few of uh, iterations, but this is, you know, currently what um, it looks like uh, now at the moment. So what our dashboard is showing us um, to date is that we've so far we've tested over a little over 9000 patients since um, mid March. At the moment, we have a cumulative positivity rate of about 28%. Um, and we're also tracking our um, seven-day metrics, which is what um, you know, the city is currently tracking here in Chicago, which is what we're using to help compare what we're seeing in our community and our neighborhoods as compared to the, to the rest of the city. So over the past seven days, um, we've tested close to 500 patients, um, and we do have a positivity rate of 9% at the moment. Um, and this is uh, this 9% um, is double um, what the rate of the city of Chicago is at the moment. So it, we are still seeing a disproportionate high rate among our Latino population. Over to the right, um, you'll see what the trend um, has been over the past few months. So our peak at Esperanza was at the end of April and early May. Um, this is where um, at some point there was a one day high of 72% positivity. And just to you know, explain that, you know, we, were, we were testing about 200 patients a day and out of those patients, 72% came back positive. You know, on a personal note, I, I got very little sleep over those weeks. Those are really are um, the only thing I can describe them as are like the scariest weeks of my 15 year career as a nurse. I mean, yeah, just watching, um, you know, the purple line across that graph and seeing, because at the un you're at the unknown in real time, right back then. So that's, mm -hmm. it's incredibly alarming and um, again, probably traumatic to live through. So I wanted you to help, you know, kind of give some more context to what you're capturing the dashboard to, you know, give us an idea of um, this kind of holistic approach you're taking and looking at the your patients and. Sure. So um, this is a, a visual of uh, this dashboard here of who we have been serving since the pandemic started. And I think it also begins to tell its own story um, about um, close to half of the patients who have come in for testing um, identify as male. And this is an increase of the usual health seeking patterns that we tend to see around, you know, among men. And so I think this is um, tells us something about how um, the uh, there is um, uh, in, enough um, a critical um, worry that we were seeing folks who might not have seek uh, health care before coming in um, now to, to receive care. In addition, half of the patients who um, we've been serving for COVID testing um, are uninsured, which is also higher than our usual uninsured percentage, which is typically about 30%. So we had an additional 20% of uninsured patients come in for, for testing. Um, we uh, also um, were able to see that nearly all of our patients are under 100% of the federal poverty level. Um, most of the patients that we've tested, about 90%, um, do identify as um, Latino, um, Latinx, 
um, and about 58% of those who we tested had never been served by Esperanza before. So all of this does, you know, start painting the picture and it does make some sense as we were the only uh, main testing site for almost two full months um, at the peak of the pandemic. And then lastly, um, our, the population who we were testing, um, they, it did tend to lean a little bit young. And this also makes sense um, as it's the, the working age population um, who was really um, being exposed and um, contracting the virus. Yeah, I think these demographics are, are really um, provide a lot of insight, especially in thinking about how many new patients were coming in, right? And seeing that uh, a lot of them were male, maybe perhaps relative to what you saw in the past and, mm -hmm. and also the, just the, the increase in, in the percentage of uninsured and, and just thinking about maybe cultural norms around how working men in Latino culture may not seek uh, healthcare as much and then seeing this kind of change in your demographics through this period is, is interesting, I think. Right, and I think this is something that, you know, post-COVID, uh, we need to continue to, to, to address because this is clearly a population who um, has not been connected to, um, to a medical home in the past, and now we're seeing that the need is still there. Exactly. Um, so do, if you just want to share kind of some, some you know, positive stories here about some of the partnerships you built through this process. Sure. So this picture here represents um, our, our work over the past two months um, where we worked with partners, both new and established, to fill the gaps that patients are reporting as an area need for them. So we've done donation drives for food, for diapers, for um, masks and PPE, you know, art supplies. And we're also fortunate enough to have um, a partnership with um, Working Bikes, um, a local biking um, refurbished organization that gave out um, kids a safe physical activity option for the summer um, through a donation of bikes. So we're really happy to be forming these strong, um, you know, close relationships to make sure that, you know, patients have access to the things that will keep them um, healthy. So out of, out of challenging times, some, some great collaborations and partnerships evolved, if, if you will. Um, do you want to just share a couple more uh, successes? Uh, there's, you know, a laundry list here. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, so, you know, to date, we've tested a little over 9,000 patients. And incidentally, um, half of those patients who have been tested were tested at, our, at a brand new location that wasn't even open one year prior to the pandemic. So sometimes it just, you know, laying awake at night thinking about how this building wasn't even around a year prior and like what really would have happened to the community at that time. Um, but, um, you know, continuing, we, we have been able to triage patients away from the hospital. This was definitely a benefit to the hospital system. It prevented a potential financial burden to our patients. Um, it prevented, you know, potential hospital exposure to COVID. And of course, you know, going to the hospital, it's not the most pleasant experience. So, of course, we kept patients from having to go there. We were able to provide wraparound services for COVID-19, including, you know, hundreds and thousands of letters uh, returning to work as folks really needed that to really get back to their lives. Um, we provided bilingual education and linkage to resources. We've been able to create access through our telehealth transformation. We've seen a significant drop in no-show rates um, because it's a much more convenient way to deliver care. And uh, right now we're, we're providing care, 130% uh, of our budgeted encounters um, because of the decrease in no-show rates. Um, we've been able to keep our patients and staff members safe by providing um, flexible um, remote work. Um, we've brought on board 10 new medical providers since March to help us address the pandemic. Um, through these new partnerships where we're thinking about how to support the communities that we serve. We've um, done numerous, um, you know, media um, segments, you know, reaching city, state, and national audiences. And, you know, we've definitely made our voices heard to um, local policymakers. And then there's a typo there, but <laughs> that's supposed to say data transparency. Um, to the general public. All of our dashboards are available on our, on our Esperanza website. And there is um, so much interest right now in data given that we see these numbers and trend lines on our news reports and social media um, feeds pretty much on a daily basis. That's, that's so great. Like I said, uh, such a, a laundry list of, of pretty great outcomes that have come out of, of this period. Um, you don't need to touch on each one of these here, Carmen, but just maybe some challenges um, as well. Sure. I think, you know, the, the top one, the, you know, seeing the healthcare inequities for our Latino patients has been amplified. They're disproportionately affected for numerous reasons. And it's something that, you know, we need to work together to address because it's just, it's, it's not right, you know, what our patients, what our, our communities are going through right now. Um, I would say that, you know, um, 
the digital divide, the technology piece that Rita mentioned earlier, you know, our families have had so much trouble, you know, as they embark um, on e-learning again, uh, once again this fall. Um, it's a, a priority that our families have, but they really have limited resources on how to um, make sure that they're, you know, that they have the, 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 not just the equipment, but also the broadband to offer their kids, you know, a proper, you know, and safe education this summer, this fall. And so we um, are hearing those stories from our patients um, again. So we're really concerned about that. And then of course, um, the, any outcomes from the economic um, downturn that's, that's surely to come. Yeah, and I think, you know, one, one really kind of bright star I'm seeing here from your work is just this building of trust of, of healthcare through your clinics in the community and, and how that this engagement with healthcare is going to be so necessary, whether it's contact tracing or thinking about vaccinations in the future, um, having this trust rebuilt or building is such an important part of, of your story. So I just want to, I know you have this great slide here with a bunch of uh, pictures from your community if you wanted to just kind of highlight. Sure, um, I'll leave you with this um, one last page of pictures of our brave and incredibly dedicated team. Um, they really rolled up their sleeves and they tested you know, thousands of patients and they didn't let Chicago's snow, rain, wind, or you know, the harsh heat that we're experiencing right now get in the way of serving our community. I'm so grateful um, to have them on our team and to be part of this team as well. Great, well, thank you so much, Carmen. Um, we're gonna get back to you in just a minute um, when we open up for just a few questions. Um, I just wanted to bring everyone back to uh, some County Health Rankings resources uh, to help think about any of this um, work that you'd wanna take on in your own communities. Uh, again, at County Health Rankings, we provide tools and resources in the areas of data. I talked about those, the county snapshots, for example, um, evidence, uh, what works for health. We have different strategies there. Um, our guidance space, where we have some action learning guides and our action center, and, and also sharing stories as well. Um, our partner center is a really important part of our action center, and I think that's a really um, relevant to today's uh, webinar because it really helps you to think about how to better partner perhaps with community-based organizations or the healthcare sector or federally qualified health centers or if you're looking for funders to do some of this work. Um, I think this part of our website really is a great way to think about how to improve uh, collaboration and support the idea of um, really working across sectors together to make these positive changes in communities. Um, lastly, we'd really love to hear from you uh, about today's webinar's content and just um, this uh, new series we've done through, with COVID. So we're going to have a, um, a link put in the chat box, an evaluation link, just a few questions. Um, if you could help us with those, that'd be great. And I'd like to get to um, just a few questions. I know we've had a lot entered uh, ahead of time, and I'm going to let um, Ali come into the space now and, and share maybe some questions from the audience. Yeah, great. Thanks, Justin. We've had sure. um, some great questions come in. Um, and I think, you know, I might just turn it over um, just maybe to Rita first. Um, but what would what are some strategies for engaging community in widespread COVID testing prevention and laying the groundwork for vaccination education? Thanks. Um, I think one of the biggest things for us is really making sure that we're talking with our communities, uh, specifically around um, the vaccinations. Uh, we know we're, we're going to be looking at doing some listening sessions with our affiliates um, in the coming weeks uh, to discuss about what, what fears do they continue to have. As, as Justin mentioned, you know, immigration policy continues to be the forefront, but also the data and privacy issues, um, the, the safety of, of any vaccination that is coming, you know, along the way. I think that's a, a critical thing, but I think what's really super important for us is that um, our communities need to be involved in, in in the biomarkers and making sure that any type of vaccine that is in the pipeline into the next phase two and three, that it does work for our communities. And so I think it's super important for us to be involved as a community in terms of the diversity of our communities. I've been seeing a lot of messages around the, uh, the Afro-Latino um, perspective. And I think that's just as important in terms of our, our um, even our biomarkers, right? Um, in regards to looking at contact tracing and, and uh, community testing, We've been working across the board with um, different agencies to kind of really assess, you know, what is the best the cultural way and the language appropriate way to be able to do contract tracing. Uh, we, while we don't have a national, you know, concerted, coordinated effort to do that um, currently, I think we're working on a community level and, and state by state effort right now. 
I don't know if Carmen, you want to add anything around the strategies and the vaccine. I think it's really important for um, our community to be part of the trials. And I know that there is a lot of fear related to participating in research because of you know historical um, practices. And so we're hoping to be part of town halls um, here at the local level, um, Spanish speaking town halls, where we can really explain what's involved in the trial and really why it's important to participate. Um, you know, with, with you know, the research that's being done. Great, thank you both. I, I know that was just one question, but we've had so much good content that we're super tight on time. And um, again, the um, purpose of the discussion group is really to carry this conversation forward um, and hear from everyone in the audience. So um, if you um, would like to continue this conversation, uh, we're plugging uh, a link, it's a separate Zoom room uh, into the uh, chat right now. And if you could join us uh, in the discussion room, if you'd like uh, to join our guests and continue this conversation, that would be Great. I just want to thank everyone for being part of the webinar today. Uh, immense thanks to our guests once again, and um, from County Health Rankings and Roadmaps and from Unidos US, we really hope that this content has helped uh, to think about how you can better serve Latino communities as we think about um, pandemic times and uh, in the future. So thanks again um, for your uh, joining us today and have a great afternoon. <laughs>